Good evening. I'm Dr. Jeff Temple, John Seeley Distinguished Chair in Community Health at UTMB, a licensed psychologist and the founding director of UTMB's Center for Violence Prevention. It is honored to be with you representing UTMB Health, sponsor of tonight's Thought Leader Lecture Series. This evening, we'll learn more about NASA's Human Exploration Research Analog, an Earth-based simulator that allows NASA to study and gain insight into the impact of isolation and confinement on humans. In space, like on Earth, complex and stressful situations can take their toll on the physical, mental, and emotional health of even the most well-trained astronaut or the most highly functioning family member. Just as NASA does with this amazing simulator, our research and clinical programs at UTMB work to understand mental health and the human mind and equip individuals for success. One difference, of course, is that while NASA looks to the challenges of travel and life in space, our focus is a little closer to home. We applaud NASA's efforts and salute the individuals making this important work possible. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy this evening's presentation. Hello, I'm William T. Harris, President and CEO of Space Center Houston. A nonprofit science center, we provide the public with dynamic science and space exploration learning experiences. We also serve as the official visitor center for NASA Johnson Space Center. Our exhibits and programs share the story of human space exploration, past, present, and future, with more than 1.25 million visitors annually from around the world through on-site and virtual experiences. Thank you for joining Space Center Houston's Thought Leader Series program, Human Exploration Research Analog, or HERA, presented by University of Texas Medical Branch. Our series features space and science experts from across the country who provide insights and perspectives on space exploration. Through our Thought Leader Series and other programming, Space Center Houston makes science and learning about space exploration accessible to everyone. This summer, our exhibits and programming will be themed around pushing human limits, Guests will be afforded a rare look at how astronauts are trained for human space exploration and preparing, in fact, to go back to the moon and on to Mars. You can discover how astronauts train on land, underwater, and beyond. Only Space Center Houston takes the public behind the scenes at NASA Johnson Space Center, the home of astronaut training. When you take the tour, you'll learn about soaking up the summer with unique astronaut experiences, including breakfast with an astronaut on Fridays and Saturdays, you can dive into the world of extreme sports with our new summer exhibit, Beyond Human Limits. You can discover the similarities between the training and preparation astronauts complete for spaceflight and the training that goes into extreme sports. Beyond Human Limits opens May 29th and will remain open through September 6th. When you board the NASA tram tour, you'll see astronaut training facilities and an actual Apollo Saturn V rocket at Rocket Park. You can avoid time in line with advanced time ticket admission. Plan your visit with us today by going to spacecenter.org and review our Know Before You Go guide for more information. And now on with our May Thought Leader Series panel, Human Exploration Research Analog, HERA, presented by UTMB. HERA is one of several analogs used by NASA's Human Research Program to study ways to prepare NASA astronauts for deep space exploration. Simply defined, a spaceflight analog is a situation on Earth that produces physical and mental effects on the body similar to those experienced in space. HERA is a unique three-story habitat designed to serve as an analog for isolation, confinement, and remote conditions and exploration scenarios. During an analog research investigation, NASA's HERA crew tries to mimic as many of the spaceflight conditions as possible. I'm delighted to welcome our expert panelists who are five members of former HERA missions. Our panelists will describe what it's like to participate in and experience this important research. Chris, Maddie, and Rand Franco were from Her are from HERA 10, along with Carrie Harris, Dan Monlux, and Osama Allen, three of the four crew members from the most recent analog campaign five. I'm gonna give some background about each of the panelists, and then each one is gonna provide us with a little information about themselves and their experiences before we start, I think, a really interesting conversation. Our first panelist is Chris Maddie. ISS Program Integrator at NASA Johnson Space Center. As a member of the ISS Space Station Program Office, Chris's responsibilities include planning and execution of next generation life support systems for human missions to deep space, as well as continued operations of the space station. Chris has also worked on the Orion and Space Shuttle programs and joint efforts with the US Department of Defense. He also supports multiple research and development grants and educational outreach. He holds a BS in aerospace engineering from the University of Oklahoma 
and an MS in, in Astroparticle Physics from the University of Houston Clear Lake. Our second panelist is Ron Franco. Ron served as a NASA Human Exploration Research Analog 2016 Mission Specialist for a 30-day deep space simulation at NASA Johnson Space Center. He's a retired U.S. Air Force pilot and a captain at American Airlines with more than 10,000 hours flight time in jet craft. He served as a research simulation pilot for the alternative clearances experiment at NASA Langley in 2015. He graduated in astronautical engineering from the United States Air Force Academy and holds a Bachelor's of Science in Aerospace Engineering from Syracuse University. Carrie Harris is a polar scientist and adventurer who has studied how climate warming impacts ecosystems in the Arctic and Antarctica. She's currently pursuing a PhD in Earth Sciences at Dartmouth College. Carrie chose a career in polar science because she loves exploring remote locations and tackling the challenges of living and working in extreme conditions like the cold, darkness of polar night. Her claim to fame is that she once dissected sea cucumbers by the light of the, her headlamp in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. Carrie also harbors a lifelong interest in human spaceflight. She was honored to participate in the 21st NASA HERA mission in which she and three crewmates lived in a spaceship at Johnson Space Center for 45 days while simulating a mission to Mars. When she's not working, Carrie loves exploring the many hiking trails in New Hampshire. Sama Elian is a fourth year PhD candidate in microbiology and molecular genetics at Michigan State University. Usama is working in the lab of Dr. Matthew Schrenk. His research is centered around geomicrobiology and astrobiology, focused on understanding life in the deep biosphere and how it can inform the search for life in places such as Mars, Europa, Enceladus, and yet to be discovered worlds. Osama earned degrees in biology and art history. He's a frequent camper, road tripper, pilot, and skydiver. Our final panelist is Daniel Monlux, Dan is completing his residency training in aerospace medicine at the Navy Aerospace Medicine Institute. He was recently selected as the next senior medical officer of the USS Abraham Lincoln. He attended medical school at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences, followed by family medicine residency training at Fort Belvoir Community Hospital. After further training as a Naval Flight Surgeon, he was selected as aeromedical dual designator, which means pilot physician, and assigned to US Naval Hospital Okinawa where he served as department head for the branch medical clinic, uh, Futunama, and supported MCAS Futunama headquarters and headquarters squadron and commander fleet activities, Okinawa uh, pilots as a flight surgeon. Dan is a board certified in family medicine and will complete specialty training in aerospace medicine in June, 2021. He's also a designed FAA aviation medical examiner and holds instructor qualifications for single engine, multi-engine, and instrument airplane flight. In addition to his passion for aviation, he enjoys sailing, technical scuba diving, alpine skiing, and woodworking. What an amazing group of individuals, and I'm so curious to learn more about your experiences participating in HERA. So now let's begin hearing from our panelists, and we'll start with Chris. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to start a little bit with a general overview of HERA, um, what HERA is and kind of the background of what it's about. This is the um, HERA itself. You can see it's um, not much bigger than a trailer home, basically a very small house. Um, it is inside of a larger hangar and you can see um, the two people there for scale. So it's not a very big place. But we use the HERA to do um, extended kind of space analog missions, as we said, which is an extended simulation of a deep space mission. So HERA was originally built for desert rats or uh, the Desert Research and Technology Initiative, where we take hardware out into the desert and we do kind of our um, general field testing to see how the hardware is going to work in an extreme environment before we launch it into space. So as part of that, they built the HERA module and they used it out in the desert to see, kind of, again, kind of how it would work as a piece of space hardware. Um, after that, it was retired from Desert Rats and now we use it in an aircraft hangar on site at NASA Johnson Space Center in Building 220. And that is where we perform the HERA missions. And so the HERA itself is about 148 um, cubic meters of internal volume. So again, the size of a small house about 750 square feet. And it's generally, that's a pretty good analog for how big a deep space mission would be, um, how big your spacecraft would be. 
if we were going out to somewhere like Mars, somewhere like a cislunar um, halo orbiting type gateway air spacecraft, or if we were going out into deep space. And so um, it also contains, as part of that, for doing simulations, um, HERA contains all of the basic systems we would need, kind of analogs for our life support systems, our food systems, our guidance systems, the systems that you basically would drive a real spacecraft. And so this is the um, HERA-10 mission of which I was a part and Ron was a part. You can see um, me and Ron there in the middle. On the left is uh, Oscar Matthews, who works for the U.S. Navy. And on the right is Casey Stedman, who was formerly U.S. Air Force Reserve and now actually works in Huntsville at the Marshall Space Flight Center, um, supporting the ISS for payload operations. And then again, there in the background, you can see us there with the HERA, which we will all talk a bit more about. So for me myself, um, I work here at the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, and I work on the International Space Station program. You can see that picture in the back there that is a picture taken from the ISS. I always love that view of Earth. Um, you can see in the middle there, you can see kind of a thunderhead, that cloud that's going kind of up toward the sky. There's a rather big storm there right in the middle. And then you can also see the very thin layer of atmosphere off on the horizon there, which that's, you know, all that's protecting us and allowing life to thrive on here on the planet Earth. A little bit about myself. Um, I am originally from Middle Tennessee, uh, from a very small town called Winchester, near a very large Air Force base called Arnold Air Force Base that's actually by that lake down there in the middle bottom of Tennessee. Um, and there's yeah, a picture of me back when I was about 12 years old, looking very cool with my mountain bike there. Um, I have a BS in aerospace engineering, as um, stated, and a master's in astroparticle physics from the University of Houston, Clear Lake. I currently work on the International Space Station program. I have previously worked on the Space Shuttle and Orion programs. You can see there in the background, that is um, Endeavor during STS-134 docked to ISS. This picture was taken from a Russian Soyuz that had just undocked and is orbiting around. And I specialized in environmental control and life support. So these are the systems that clean the air, the systems that clean the water, and the systems that also measure the air in the water to let you know how good of a job you're doing at cleaning it. Um, you can see two of the crew members there um, working on one of my systems, the CEDRA, the carbon dioxide removal assembly, which is the system that removes carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide that we humans breathe out while you're on board the spaceship. I also do field mass spectrometry, remote sensing, and trace contaminant removal, which is um, as a human being, your body puts out a lot of different metabolic products, and we have to scrub those out of the atmosphere, again, to make sure that the atmosphere is very clean and nice to breathe. And in part of that, I also do design and implementation of next generation planning for how we're going to do that through deep space, how we're going to do that in what we call cislunar space, the space between Earth and the moon, and how we're potentially going to do that out to Mars and then living on the surface of Mars. Just a little bit of the many personal interests that I have. Um, I am a PADI dive master. I specialized in 12 um, specialized forms of diving and technical diving, including ice diving. You can see that picture there is um, us under about two feet of ice in Banff, Canada. Um, I run a lot. I have done a bunch of marathons and half marathons. I'm also a private pilot. Uh, you can see a picture taken there from me in a sailplane and glider over Texas there. I am a racing and driving instructor with uh, BMW CCA and Porsche CCA. And I also like building and taking apart pretty much everything. So you can see pretty much, um, you can see several pictures of things I'm working on there. Uh, there's a car engine in the middle there, um, a bicycle shock absorber in the, um, one of the other pictures. And I also work on quadcopters and drones. So you all are probably very familiar with kind of what's involved there. And a bit of my personal philosophy, right? I mean, we are all stronger when we work together. And as part of that, it's knowing that, you know, there's really nothing you can't do. Um, the world was not built by atomic supermen, right? The world was built by people just like you. And anything that they know, you can know if you're willing to put in the time and effort to learn it. And similarly, any large system or any big effort or goal that you see and you think, wow, that is really great. You can do that too. You know, any, uh, any idea you have, anything you see out there only exists because somebody envisioned a goal bigger than themselves and sought, you know, went about building a team and working together to work to achieve that goal. And so, you know, absolutely, really anything you want to do, the sky and space is the limit. And with that, thank you very much. Just fascinating, very interesting background. I can't wait till we get to the q and I think I'm going to feel that way about all of you. Our next speaker is Ron Franco. 
Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Chris, and uh, it's nice to virtually see you again. Um, although Chris and I have several uh, common interests, I came to Harif from a very unique background compared to some of the contemporaries. I actually grew up during the Apollo missions. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I don't remember the first man on the moon, but I do remember my seventh surprise birthday where they got me to come into the house by saying, hey, Ronald, an astronaut's hitting a golf ball on the moon. So I ran in the house as fast as I could. I threw the door open. Uh, the kids yelled surprise, and I was mortified to find out that my mom invited two girls to my birthday party. But uh, I do have a lot of uh, memories from the early Apollo days. And uh, during those times, if you've ever seen the movie Toy Story, what you see in the movie actually happened in America. In the 1950s, uh, Westerns were, were all the rage. But by the 1960s, kids my age wanted to become astronauts. And uh, they didn't just want to become astronauts. They were going to become astronauts. Uh, the toys, the magazines, the movies like 2001, um, many, much of the, the nation had kind of a space fever. And uh, the solution to becoming an astronaut back then was, was actually pretty simple. You went into the military. Uh, if you were fortunate enough, you went to pilot training. Uh, even better, test pilot school. You got a degree in some kind of um, STEM, especially engineering, and uh, you were going to be an astronaut. Well, we all know that uh, by 2001, it wasn't quite like a space odyssey. And uh, someone wrote a book called The Orphans of Apollo. I guess I'm one of those. But it has been a fascinating life um, of flight. And I'll just briefly tell you a little bit about how I came to Hera. So I was fortunate enough to attend the Air Force Academy and uh, fly the T-38, the astronaut trainer. That's actually my girlfriend at the time and my uh, wife now, uh, Deborah Qualiano. Chris and I do in fact have a lot of common interests and I, and I noticed some of the other people do too. Um, I might, I've run a marathon or two. Um, I do some scuba diving, I've flown some drones. And I think the personality that uh, back in those days was attracted to uh, being an astronaut has changed a little bit now. I think um, there's quite a diverse group of people who are being selected as astronauts, and we're going to find out a little bit more about um, what's going to happen with that group in the future. So I was blessed to uh, have a, quite a few different aircraft that I've flown and been on quite a few different contingencies in the military. That eventually led to a job at American Airlines, and I recently upgraded to uh, captain um, on the Airbus 321. And uh, I, I've had a phenomenal life. I wouldn't trade growing up during the Apollo days for anything, but I very, very much envy the young people and what they're going to see, what some of you will see in your lifetimes. I do soaring, like um, Chris mentioned, and uh, that's actually Apollo moonwalker Charlie Duke. I'm fortunate to have met some of my heroes and actually become friends with a few of them and uh, took Charlie up for a little flight in, in, our, in our local glider. So, as far as when I first heard about um, Hera, I did a little bit of research and there is a Apollo connection. For Skylab, just before the first crew went, Bob Crippen and his crew did something called SMEET. They actually did a 56 day isolation experiment right at Johnson Space Center. And uh, I contacted Bob Crippen who happened to fly the first space shuttle mission. He was nice enough to send me a couple pictures. The uh, clean cut on the left, and then uh, the day that they got out of their Smeet experiment. So Hera and Smeet are, are actually uh, cousins through time. Uh, the difference was that Smeet was a pressurized, uh, and the pressurized um, vehicle is still at Johnson Space Center. Hera's there on the left with my team. We were unpressurized, but um, it's common for NASA to try to do as much as they can in a safe environment where they can research and find out what's going to happen prior to sending a group into uh, orbit. If you take a look at that small picture in the middle, each of our teams at the time had put a, a patch up, a sticker in the uh, Hera habitat. And I found an old one from 1972 on eBay and slapped it up there in honor of the SMEAT team. Oh, I love this slide. Uh, this is from, from a long talk I give on Hera and it's supposed to be me meeting some of the premier astronauts um, uh, who've served recently on the International Space Station. But one of my friends said, no, it looks like you're a salesman for the hair club for men. 
<laughs> so I included that one. When I found out about Hera uh, as a kid who wanted to be an astronaut and, and you know, went through as much of the uh, routine as I could to live like an astronaut for 30 days for mission 10, to eat the same food that they were eating, do the same experiments that they were doing, sleep in quarters similar to what they had on the uh, International Space Station. Uh, it was very appealing to me and I applied and was fortunate enough to be selected. Uh, my mission, my uh, mission responsibility was um, MS-1, Mission Specialist 1, which included an awful lot of um, uh, virtual reality. And remember, this is five years ago. I'm sure it's come a long way since then, but uh, even at the time, NASA was doing amazing things with virtual reality. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few minutes, I think. Next, and I think final slide, that's my team. We're still all very close friends, and uh, we're actually planning a five-year reunion this year. So with that, thank you very much, and I'll look forward to uh, hearing from my colleagues. Thank you so much, Ron, for that really interesting piece of information about your background. Now we'll hear from Carrie Harris. Great, thank you so much for that introduction, and thanks to everyone who's tuning in. Uh, it's really great to be here. So I'm an Earth Sciences PhD student at Dartmouth, Dartmouth College currently, um, and I've been working in this field for over a decade and been lucky enough to travel all over the world to conduct my research. I ultimately fell in love with the polar regions and have traveled to the Arctic and Antarctica many times, but my career trajectory has been anything but straightforward, and I've taken a lot of twists and turns along the way, mainly because I allowed my sense of adventure to lead the way. Uh, so I want to back up to the beginning to tell you the story of how I got to where I am today. So this is me and my sisters when I'm eight years old. I'm the one in the solar system sweatshirt, and as a kid, I really wanted to become an astronaut. I loved looking at the night sky and talking to my dad about black holes, and I was really attracted to the enormity of the challenge to live and work in space. Um, but when I got to college in coastal Maine, uh, I really fell in love with marine science. And I started to take a lot of classes about coastal ecosystems and learned about the ocean and all the strange animals that live there. And I realized that there are a lot of places left to be explored here on Earth. So when I was 22, I got the opportunity to go to the Arctic for the first time as a research assistant studying lakes and marine environments in Arctic Alaska. And this was my first taste of doing scientific field work in a remote and isolated place. Uh, we traveled by helicopter from lake to lake where we carried an inflatable raft on backpacks and would inflate it and paddle it out to the middle of lakes to collect our samples and i was just immediately hooked the following year i returned to arctic alaska again this time to start my master's degree with the university of texas at austin where i studied uh, food web connections in the coastal arctic ocean and the landscape was just incredible i was so taken by the gray icy waters that had um, you know, ice flows and uh, icebergs that ranged anywhere from the size of my hand to the size of my house. Um, and the scientific questions that we were trying to answer were also really um, interesting to me. And it was basically a race to characterize and understand these fragile ecosystems before they're permanently altered by climate warming. After I completed my master's degree, um, I really wanted to try something that was less of an intense academic pursuit. And so I decided that my next adventure was going to be hiking the 2000 mile Appalachian Trail, which is a footpath that travels from Georgia all the way to Maine. Um, and since I had lived in Maine before, I felt like this would be like walking home. And it was this grand adventure that's really hard to sum up quickly, um, but it really was a challenge uh, physically, which I was expecting, and mentally in ways that I was not so much expecting. Um, but it was uh, a great experience, and by the end of it, I realized that the analytical part of my brain um, was really uh, wanting to get used a bit more, and so I decided that it was time to jump back into research full time. Um, so this time I traveled to the other pole, to Antarctica, where I studied permanently ice-covered lakes in the McMurdo Dry Valleys of Antarctica. And this was the most intense logistics that I've ever been involved with. Uh, we essentially carried about 2,000 pounds of sampling gear from lake to lake in this glaciated valley. And so we moved equipment either by helicopter support or by physically carrying it in backpacks from camp to camp. And because the lakes that we studied were permanently ice covered, we were able to erect these canvas sampling tents 
um, that provided us with a little bit of protection from the extreme wind and uh, really cold temperatures that were about negative 20 degrees uh, during the day. And so from the protection of these uh, sampling huts, we could drill through the about 15 feet of ice cover on the lakes to access the water column below and collect samples. And then in 2019, I was invited to join the largest Arctic expedition to date. Um, and the purpose of this expedition was to freeze an icebreaker that's shown here in this picture in the sea ice for an entire year and allow it to drift naturally with the sea ice itself while scientists can study the linked climate system of the ocean, sea ice, and atmosphere. So I joined this expedition for the first two months, um, which was when polar summer was gradually transitioning into polar night. So we had many days where we just had this twilight effect for the whole time um, before the sun finally set and it wouldn't rise again for six months. Um, and again, I was really struck by the intensity of the logistics, uh, both in terms of our equipment, um, getting it on and off this icebreaker and working on ice flows that are fragile and constantly changing. Um, and then also the interpersonal logistics of uh, coordinating and cooperating on this expedition that involved about 30 different countries. So polar regions can be relevant to space sciences uh, for several reasons. The first is that the working conditions themselves can be used as an analog for working conditions, um, potentially in a space station in orbit or in another area that's really um, isolated and confined. Um, and second, because the polar regions are so extreme in terms of the physical environment itself, that the microbial life we find there can provide clues for how life might have evolved on other worlds like Mars or Europa. So at first, Polar science and being an astronaut might not seem that related, but my experiences of living and working in these extreme isolated and sometimes confined environments of being on research ships and remote field camps ended up being great preparation for my experience with HERA. Um, and some of the things that I learned along the way are being able to find common grounds with people who come from very different backgrounds than myself um, and working collectively towards a common goal. Um, and equally as important is learning to really appreciate sleep and good food and coffee when it's available, all of which was transferable to my HERA experience. And I'm sure my crewmates uh, can tell you the great lengths we went to to ensure that our limited coffee supply was rationed out and lasted the whole mission. Um, so it really was an honor to participate in HERA and get to be part of something that will ultimately help improve uh, space flight for astronauts. Um, and it's an honor to be here today along with two of my crewmates. So thank you so much. Thanks, Carrie. And I agree that coffee is an essential food item. I don't know how I would survive without it. <laughs> and our final, our next to last speaker is Osama Alian, who is going to now share his uh, experiences. Osama. Hi, hey, this is a really uh, awesome privilege to be here and to be able to share a little bit about my background and how I ended up in here and in, in this field and uh, sort of following the same pattern that Carrie was talking about, um, my direction into the astrobiology and geomicrobiology field was anything but direct. Um, I actually started off in the sciences thinking I wanted to be a doctor and bright and bushy, bright eyed and bushy tailed. I had actually found several opportunities to explore that field and remote places in Africa. And that was actually my first exposure to the microbiology field. Uh, where I was doing a lot of infectious disease testing and tracking as well as some vaccinations and public health work. And it sort of transitioned my interest from just the medical side to how difficult it is to do a lot of basic microbiology in remote places where you don't have access to reliable electricity or uh, uh, data sources like internet or cell phone coverage, for example. And I found that challenge uncomfortable and exciting at the same time, as well as sort of opening up opening up my idea of what I could do with science. These pictures uh, from are from around 2008 when I sort of started doing this experience. So having discovered that I'm actually super interested in microbiology, I actually became interested in a lot of the difficulties in trying to detect microbiology. And for a few years, I actually worked at this intersection between engineering 
and uh, a microbiology in designing and testing ballast water biology detection systems. So in uh, the shipping world, uh, ships and large boats use ballast systems to balance themselves out in the waves and the currents as they're loaded up, but they use seawater to do that. And turns out that is a major way for invasive species to end up in places where they don't belong. It's really important for fisheries health and for general uh, environmental well-being to be able to uh, keep invasive species from ending up where they shouldn't be. And so we ended up uh, designing and developing a system to detect species at different size ranges according to international maritime organization rules. And this was the first time I was exposed to now the engineering side trying to apply my biology and microbiology expertise side. And it involved sort of being uncomfortable with how much I don't know and learning how to be comfortable with getting skills that uh, are not necessarily in my previous repertoire. And that was particularly exciting in terms of my intellectual growth and in terms of being able to sort of combine all these unrelated different skill sets that I've had. So that ended up actually teaching me a lot more about my curiosities and trying to understand how microbes are important in this world. And the first sort of outside the normal field of expertise that I was working in was trying to understand how uh, microbes affect their hosts or interact with their environments. And I ended up actually finding myself back in Africa again, studying host microbe interactions. In this case, this is a hyena that is sleeping, it's sedated, it's not harmed. Uh, the uh, t-shirt is just to make sure that it's uh, not uncomfortable in the, su in the uh, sunlight. But uh, this ended up being my gateway into understanding uh, sort of how complex our microbial world is and how vast its effect are. In this case, we were studying sort of how the microbiomes of these animals end up affecting not only their behavior, but their physiologies. And so uh, whether it was a hyena or another animal, they'd be uh, humanely sedated, comfortably sedated, and their glands would be sampled or their skin would be sampled. And then we would run analysis on their microbial communities and relate that to observations of their behavior or their foraging or things of the such. Uh, this is actually one of the oldest behavioral um, projects in the world run out of Michigan State, the Michigan State uh, University Hyena Project, which uh, I've had the great privilege of uh, working with a lot of people over the years from and uh, learning a lot from them. And uh, that actually opened up my world of microbiology even further. We went now from looking at host microbiome interactions in terms of curiosity to, well, now I'm interested in as far as what these microbes do. And instead of a host in a traditional biological sense, like a human being or an animal, I began thinking about microbe environment interactions. And I ended up learning how to sample and dig in really strange and exciting areas. On the left side is sort of what it would look like if we were to gather up all our supplies and go to a well that we had uh, drilled into a uh, geologic formation in Lower Lake in California to try to sample for uh, microbes that are living in the aquifers and trying to understand how they're able to survive in this relatively extreme environment. And this is not dissimilar from what would happen if we had astronauts on the ground on Mars or on the moon trying to sample subsurface environments and trying to understand the chemistry and biology if there's biology there. And it's kind of cool to do that because some of these formations actually look very much like Mars. This was a serpentinite formation on the lower right hand corner, which is essentially what we were drilling into underneath uh, the, the subsurface there. But I've also taken my research to the ocean uh, deep in the middle of the Atlantic and we've had to use remote vehicles to also sample some of that uh, fluids and microbiology from these really cool carbonate formations. And I think this is actually the most exciting aspect of my work because as opposed to packing a car and road tripping to the middle of nowhere to try to sample, we have to work with a very collaborative team get on a ship and use remotely operated vehicles and equipment to sample uh, uh, sites that are deep below the ocean, some, some of them that were accidentally discovered. For my research project, we heavily rely on uh, uh, the remotely operated vehicle JSON to be able to sample those environments. And this is very analogous to what we do now in terms of projects like Mars Curiosity or Mars Perseverance, where we have to learn how to sample and what kind of science to run from hundreds or thousands or millions of miles away and be able to reproduce that science. My favorite thing to tell some folks that is uh, that it took us longer to get to my field study site in the middle of the Atlantic than it took for the astronauts to go to the moon and come back. And we had to do it dodging hurricanes, which was a very exciting 
experience. But as you could tell from the lower left corner there, this is a team environment that does not look dissimilar from Mission Control Center in Houston or uh, the Operations Center at Jet Propulsion Lab. And it's a great analog environment for trying to proof how we run our research uh, experiences and projects remotely and technically. And it's also a great test bed for testing equipment that we would like to send to other worlds. And to tie it all together, uh, all these field sites and all these locations that I sampled host a specific type of chemical reaction that we think is actually fairly common. So we're not just trying to understand biology in random locations, we're trying to understand biology that we've detected that lives purely off of a chemical reaction between water and rock that we think is actually a lot more common in the universe. And we think it may have happened on early Earth way before we've showed up. Uh, these chemical reactions we think are happening in the subsurface of Mars. We think they're definitely happening in the subsurface oceans of Europa. And we know for a fact that at least as far as my study site is concerned, the Cassini probe was able to detect almost the exact same chemistry uh, emanating from plumes shooting out into space from Enceladus. So what we learn in these analog environments on Earth is helping lay down the framework for what we would like to ask in terms of research questions and what equipment and techniques we would like to be to develop in order to sample uh, these other worlds. But when I'm not in the lab or teaching, uh, I am a crazy uh, hunter of uncomfortable things. My wonderful wife, who's incredibly patient with me, likes to say that if it's uncomfortable and she'll hate it, I'll probably do it. Uh, I've been flying for almost 20 years and I've been in a large number of, of aircraft and jets, which I feel very privileged to do. And I've been skydiving for almost 10 years, which seems like the natural progression from flying them. But when I'm not in the air, I'm probably on the road somewhere trying to get away. I think before we were remotely working, I became an expert into trying to figure out a way to remote work from a remote campsite in the middle of the American Southwest. And uh, I also like to explore these uncomfortable and far out places with a really group, a uh, great group of friends that also like to get in airplanes and explore really backwards area that are hardly accessible except by airplane or really creative thinking. And I think all of this really led me to Hera as an experience because it felt like I was already doing a lot of these remote, uh, isolated experiences by virtue of my work or hobbies. And I wanted to see if I could actually do it in a much more constrained environment. And I am very privileged to have been able to do that after selection. And I'm super excited to see how these evolve into uh, preparing the next phases of human spaceflight uh, in the Artemis program and beyond. And uh, that's it for me. Wow, Osama, that is absolutely fascinating. And it's remarkable the research that you're doing like all of the others and look forward to our conversation in just a few moments. And our final panelist today is Dan Munlox. Dan, we look forward to hearing your remarks. Uh, thank you, William. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. And it's just been fascinating listen, listening to everybody else who's gone, gone before me. Um, really, uh, I think highlights an experience I had in the uh, during our HERA mission, which is that, you know, we were isolated, but I felt like I was probably in the most interesting or the most interesting group of uh, people, the most interesting room that uh, that I'd ever been in. Um, so as you mentioned before, I, I'm a, um, currently completing my aerospace medicine residency in the in the United States Navy and getting ready to go out and be the the senior medical officer on board the the aircraft carrier, the USS Abraham Lincoln. Um, I also recently founded a company called uh, Wingman Men. Um, which helps to to keep pilots with complex medical uh, medical problems uh, flying safely. I got here kind of by a, a fairly circuitous route. Um, initially, uh, during my I grew up in a, a small rural town in in California called Potter Valley. Uh, attended my undergraduate training at uh, Otterbein University, which is in Westerville, Ohio, uh, where I had a uh, graduate with a computer science degree. Uh, and then started my professional career in the uh, in the military in the United States Navy. Uh, this this first picture is um, is the F-18 that I flew um, along with uh, several other uh, the other uh, pilots in my squadron uh, in support of um, operations uh, Southern Watch and Iraqi Freedom back in, in uh, the initial phases of that conflict. Uh, and here we are during that same deployment uh, as the, the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk uh, that has since been retired 
uh, but she she was home uh, our home during those many deployments and, and during our uh, our combat tour um, for for Iraqi freedom. After I finished with my my initial aviation commitment to the the Navy, I uh, didn't want to get out of uniform, but uh, but decided that it was time for a transition uh, in terms of my my career track, and I decided to go into into medical school. Uh, I attended medical school starting in 2008 at the Uniformed Services University. Uh, and this is a, a picture of me during uh, during my medical school training, assisting in the uh, in the operating room. Uh, I should point out I'm I'm not a surgeon by training. Uh, my my initial specialty training was in was in family medicine, in fact, which I did at uh, the Port Belvoir Community Hospital. Uh, and I, this is here um, trying to trying to teach some uh, some tidbits to my son Andrew, who's now nine. This has been a been a while ago. Um, but uh, that's where I completed my initial uh, initial training. Outside of my my professional career, um, I tend to, along with with several of the other folks here, like to um, like to engage in some fairly adventurous hobbies. This particular picture is a is a backcountry skiing trip that I that I went on. Um, I'm just just down below the rim of of Mount Fuji in Japan. Uh, we hiked up there to around fourteen thousand feet and uh, to uh, to start our uh, our ski trip down and uh, really a pretty unique uh, unique trip there. I also enjoy uh, technical scuba diving. Um, this is this is me uh, gearing up for um, for a dive to the the aircraft carrier. Um, seeing a theme with aircraft carriers here, but the USS Oriskany, which was uh, sank as an artificial reef off the off the coast of Florida and the in the Gulf Coast of Mexico. Um, it's keel is in about 220 or 230 feet of, uh, of seawater. And it's a really, really unique, exciting dive. I think something that drew me to, to Hera is um, through my aviation career in, in single seat tactical airplanes um, and in medicine where you know, you're often making decisions kind of, um, I think people perceive on your on your own or in the back country or in scuba diving, you're, you're really, uh, certainly self-reliance is important but really it's working with teams and relationships with the people around you that become sort of the most important aspect of, uh, of any of those activities. Um, and so this is, you know, though I go flying in a single seat airplane um, in aviation, we always fly with a wingman. And this is a, a good friend of mine, Chris Smith, who's um, since separated from the Navy and has gone to business school and has uh, moved on with, uh, with his life, but, um, but certainly you know, critical to our mission accomplishment and uh, the success of our flights back when I was flying. Uh, but not just a wingman, a whole squadron. And this this happens to be the the officers in our, um, again, this is aboard our, our combat crews back in 2000, um, uh, shoot, 2003, I guess it was. But, uh, you know, the, this is the officers and the pilots pictured here, but there's, you know, there's an organization of two, 300 people that maintain the airplanes, you know, inside of a larger air wing aboard a larger uh, aircraft carrier and of course the whole um, you know uh, US Navy organization that goes into supporting the the single airplane launched off the front of the ship. Same thing holds true with scuba diving um, you know as you explore these uh, kind of austere environments in very isolated places uh, you can't go without a buddy or the surface crew who's tending to your um, to your needs while you're underwater and just so much goes into it in terms of uh, logistics and support from other people. Again, one of my other hobbies is uh, like like several of the other panelists here, uh, endurance running and uh, and marathons. Uh, during this COVID isolation, my my friend Landon McKinley and I uh, trained for a, an ultra marathon, and uh, and all of the long training miles and dedication to that, I think, would have been uh, fairly well impossible on my own. I might have been able to do it, but certainly much easier with uh, you know with the support of a training partner and and the the relationship that we developed there. And so comes Hera, um, and this is, um, you know, I think similar to what some of the other panelists have mentioned. I think the I was just drawn to it to see what it would be like to interact with um, such a small group of people for such a long period of time, and um, and how those dynamics would change. Because I know that you know to do anything worthwhile, it's really so dependent on on your team members and the relationships. And when those relationships are strained, as I'm, you know, as I was 
sure they would be during a during a mission such as the the one we were going on um, just how those dynamics change and how it affects mission accomplishment uh, you know i'm happy to say i thought we worked incredibly well during the course of the um the the six weeks together we didn't really run into any any big conflicts and i i was happy to to say that i think we we really remained uh yeah, i mean maintained an effective team relationship throughout the throughout the whole mission uh, but this this picture really just to to kind of highlight some of the stressors. Not only are we, you know, um, isolated with each other inside of a really small, um, uh, a small amount of real estate, you know, 700 square feet or so, um, but then during some of the mission scenarios, we're corralled even closer together. Um, and this is when we're isolated together with, uh, you know, kind of some uncomfortable gear, standing shoulder to soldier for, um, shoulder to shoulder for, for kind of an extended period for one of the, uh, the simulated emergencies that we had to deal with during the during the mission. And of course, I don't think any of us could could do what we've done in you know in life and our careers in Hera uh, without the the support of uh, kind of our most most important team members, our family. Uh, and this is this is a picture of our my family waiting for me, uh, my wife Christine, uh, stepdaughter Liz, and and son Andrew. Um, after not seeing me for you know for six weeks and just uh, you know I think we we're all uh, they were supportive throughout the whole thing but I think we we're certainly glad to be uh, reunited at the end um, and that to me was um, certainly lots of great um, great parts about Hera uh, learned a lot about myself learned a lot about my teammates uh, learned a lot about analog missions but um, but to me what makes it really all worth it is the like, my most important team there um, my my family at the end and what a great feeling to have their support and uh, and be back together with them at the end with that i look forward to the the question and answer period great dan thank you so much what fascinating backgrounds you all live and you live incredibly active and full lives and very very impressive in all that you, what that you're pursuing so my first question is how did you carve out um all of this time from your life to participate in the hera project um what what motivated you to want to do this i mean osama you touched on it a little bit and and so did dan but i'm kind of curious from all of you how did you set aside 30 to 45 days to participate in this program uh that's a great question i'll, I'll go ahead and, and um and answer first um i found out that about this experiment a year or two before before i was selected as a crew member and i was just so fascinated by it i really didn't ask permission or try to coordinate anything i just applied and figured if uh you know if i was lucky enough to be selected that i would kind of sort out the logistics on the on the back side um as it so happened i was i was enrolled in the aerospace medicine residency here at the uh the naval Air, uh, naval medicine um institute in pensacola and um and when i was selected they were just super supportive of the of the idea i think it's it's very closely related to the study of aerospace medicine which really focuses on sort of normal human physiology and um, and psychology in abnormal environments and so it really dovetailed nicely with my field of study and just kind of um, you know was lucky enough that those those two things my eligibility for para and my training program lined up yeah and for me um here you know at the nasa johnson space center obviously uh human spaceflight is what we do so um having you know designed these systems work with these systems on a daily basis both here on the ground when we're designing and building them and then going into space and doing the space operations with them it really gave me an opportunity to see these systems kind of from the other perspective right as a user as somebody who's actually you know going into the environment with the systems rather than from the perspective of the person who's building designing and building the systems so that really gave me a much more rounded perspective on all that and it was really a very great experience and so as part of that again um you know it did dovetail into kind of my career here at johnson space center and the work that i do but it was as you say it was a kind of a big part of time to you know carve out of your schedule and out of your life and that is something that requires a lot of coordination and a lot of work with your family and with your working team members as well it's, I love this question because it's not just how did we carve it out, but how did we carve it out with our families, like Chris just alluded to. And uh, from a personal perspective, when I went to American Airlines and said, hey, look, I, I need a couple months off on paid leave, um, they initially got a little bit of flack. We were in May and June, and it's a very busy time for us. 
And uh, my chief pilot went to bat and he said, if if uh, Franco can end up supporting the space program directly, by golly, we're behind him 100%. And uh, on the family perspective, Deborah and I met in junior high school. So she's gone through this with me from basically day one. And uh, she thought, you know, you know, if you can help the space program in any way, I'm behind you 100 percent. And my kids were, too. And uh, I think in, uh, in in my case, so as a graduate student, um, uh, I'm looking forward to also Carrie's perspective on this. Um, we have a weird kind of niche that we fill in where our entire employment is a training program, but we also sort of create our own training program at the same time. And there's a certain amount of autonomy and sort of self-responsibility that our departments give us. So when I knew this was going to be a likely option, I actually went straight to my department chair and told him, hey, I'm going to be disappearing for about three months to do this thing. And it ties in well to a lot of the analog stuff environmentally that we've been working on. This might dovetail really nicely with the human space flight aspect as the Artemis program was getting up and rolling. So it'd be nice to just touch upon that experience. And they were completely supportive um, of that uh, as part of that experiential training set that I'm building into my PhD program. The harder person to convince was actually my wife. And I actually gave her veto rights. I was like, hey, no harm, no foul. If you say no, I I will not think twice about it. And uh, that that was sort of a difficult thing that I appreciate she she entertained because I already have to travel a lot. And this time I was telling her, hey, I'm going to leave for an extended period of time this time without you being able to get in touch with me as easily. And uh, I think we're on a good enough wavelength that she felt uh, it was a worthwhile experience to have. And I think. Uh, it's very important to recognize that entire support system, not just professionally, but personally, that we have all of us to be able to do experiences like this, whether adventurous, personal or professional. Yeah, I think I had a similar experience to Osama where um, it kind of just aligned perfectly with my schedule that I had just finished doing field work about a month before um, this mission started. And I was actually in the process of transferring graduate schools. So while I was in Hera, I was hearing back from all these programs that I'd applied to um, via the family phone calls that we were able to have once a week. So that was kind of an exciting and special experience. And um, of course, the support of my family makes Hera and all of the other adventures that I go on possible. And I had my sister in charge of all of my financials and logistics and everything. And so she was communicating with my potential graduate advisors, um, kind of negotiating my acceptances while I was in HERA. Um, and yeah, it just all really worked out. So something that's kind of implicit in all of your responses was that you were actually away for much longer than the mission period. So I'm presuming you went through some kind of training, uh, which would make sense. So I'm curious if you could just share uh, with us what was the nature of the training? And then after the training, there must have been a post period where you debriefed. Could you kind of give us a sense of your journey from the time you were accepted into the HERA program? Well, I think it's a little different for every mission. For us um, on HERA 10, it was approximately uh, two to three weeks in front of and about two to three weeks after the mission that we had to um, get prepared. They're doing a lot of experiments on you. You are a test subject. And so they have to get um, what we call baseline data. They have to get their set of introductory data before you go into the experiment. And then after you come out, they have to get their data from you after you've come out to see how things have changed to measure kind of the different parameters they're looking for. And so as also as part of that, you know, you have to be very, very comfortable getting poked and prodded. I think I had my blood drawn probably about 50 times during the uh, duration of that. And, you know, you have to be very comfortable getting poked with needles. You have to be very comfortable getting your, you know, your nose and your ears swabbed out, um, getting MRI scans. We all got um, MRI scanned and CAT scanned, um, DEXA body scans. And so, yeah, you, you have to be kind of not really have a um, problem with people getting into your personal space and not really have difficulty with people poking and prodding on you. I, I would add, um, I think that it had changed a little bit in terms of the preparation and training from uh, from some of the earlier HERA, HERA missions and the, the biological sampling and some of the poking and prodding had, um, had fallen by the, on the wayside to a, a certain extent. Um, 
but certainly the you know the MRIs and the other, the other thing I would add that uh, that that he didn't uh, he didn't mention is that there's just there's so many systems on the that you have to interact with on um, on board the uh, the module and then once you're once the doors are shut you really don't have the support of the ground crew or anybody else to to help you with it so from 3D printers to uh, to Canada arm simulators to flight simulators to uh, virtual reality to um, you know uh, I mean, just the, the list goes on, the life support systems that uh, there's just uh, a lot of the training was certainly team building, getting to know our, our fellow crewmates, um, but also just learning how to operate the, uh, you know, the analog habitat. And I think another thing that was unique about the C5M4 mission is that um, our post mission data collection and debrief period was cut a little bit short because of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so we actually ended up all flying home about a week earlier than was planned and had to finish up some of that um, post mission data collection virtually. Um, so that was certainly a unique experience going from the literal isolation in Hera into this kind of other sort of interminable, um, you know, COVID quarantining protocols. Ron, I think you're going to share something. Just, I think Chris covered it very well for our for our group. But I'll just add that the days for us were extremely busy, um, both before, during, and after. And um, I was actually surprised that our, our boots would hit the ground in the morning, and then by seven, eight o'clock at night, we'd have a little bit of free time, and then do it again the next day. Asama, would you like to share any thoughts? I. Uh... Uh, the 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 pre and, and post period. If if we just focus on the pre period, I thought that was actually the most important part. So in our crew, we had the privilege of actually also having a backup crew that was there in case any one of us had, uh, for whatever reason, uh, would not be able to participate in the mission. And uh, I would like to give them a shout out because they actually did a lot of just social interaction with us by virtue of their participation to allow us to become closer as a crew, in addition to all the activities that were planned um, officially with the HERA program. And I think beside the actual training in terms of systems and processes and data collection and how do we deal with blood and biological samples and all that stuff, I think the actual socialization effect to be able to sort of get to know each other really quickly on a certain intellectual uh, uh, intimateness, um, if that's a word, intimacy <laughs> is uh, super important because like Dan said, when you close the door, uh, that's it, you're on your own. So even though this isn't um, an actual real flight environment where your your life could be on the line in terms of decision making, to a certain extent, you have to be comfortable with being able to lean on your crewmates uh, professionally, psychologically, emotionally. Uh, I think uh, being able to have that in the pre-mission was super important as far as our effectiveness in mission as and how comfortable we were working with each other and sort of delegating responsibility and shifting responsibilities uh, throughout. And I think the post-mission was super interesting because after we came out of the Harry experience, our families thankfully were able to come in and, and greet us as we left. But because of the truncated pandemic situation that we were in, um, we ended up with such busy schedules and we were so anxious to hang out with our families that that was sort of a stressor uh, that uh, we, we weren't necessarily prepared for. So it was sort of an interesting transition into the pandemic and sort of our own reactions to wanting to be with our families after not seeing them for 45 days uh, that I uh, just kind of sticks out in, in, in my mind. But I wanted to highlight the importance of, of that social aspect uh, pre-mission. So I'm curious, I know that one of the big goals of here is to understand how a crew is going to relate to one another during this period of being together, because you didn't choose to be together, right? You were selected to be part of this cohort and you all had to get to know each other in a really intensive way and understand that you had to collaborate because the essential thing in space travel is you have to be able to be a leader, but you have to be a follower and you have to be able to uh, really integrate and support the crew because it's the team that enables the survival of everyone if something goes wrong or kaflui. Were you aware of particular challenges or things that may have been designed not to go well or correctly that challenged your individual duties or team duties as part of the Harris project or experience for, for each of your crews? Well, for our crew, and Ron can probably speak to this too, very early on, 
we kind of collectively made the decision to, okay, you know, we're all going to work together on this. If anything's wrong, we all promise that we're not going to, you know, let, let it fester. We're not, we're going to speak up immediately. If something's wrong, we promise that, you know, I will bring up this problem immediately and everyone else promises that they will listen to you. And then we will work through that together as a crew rather than again, you know, kind of letting stuff fester and building that resentment. And then also, I mean, as far as the integration goes, I actually found that not only did we get along very well, I mean, we're, as Ron said, we are all still friends now and still talk regularly five years later, but also um, during the Hera mission itself, I found that I almost integrated these people into kind of my psyche because they're always there. And so you get very used to, you know, I know what Ron's going to think about this. I know what Casey's going to think. I know what Oscar's going to think almost before, you know, without even asking. And for a couple of weeks after the, after the fact, I found myself kind of just going, oh, hey, Ron, oh, right, Ron's not here anymore. And so that aspect of it is kind of weird because especially when you come out, you it's kind of losing, you know, a piece of yourself or losing like very close family members that you were on this mission with. Absolutely true, Chris, absolutely. Um, I felt the same way. And if I can piggyback once again on what you said, I think the secret to our bonding so quickly was that we identified the strengths and the weaknesses of each team member and we allowed them to build on those strengths and we looked to them for those strengths. Um, they called me the operator because I, I didn't have the intellectual background that, that Chris had or the, but what, but, but maybe a little bit like Dan, I could, I could fly the robot arm and we each had certain strengths and uh, weaknesses that we very, very much identified and, uh, and brought to the forefront. And I think that was really the secret to our team success. Well, I was just going to jump in and say, you guys were like the Ares 3 crew from the Martian, right? Because they weren't going to leave their buddy behind on the Martian sur surface of Mars. They're going to do whatever they could to bring, to bring him back safely. This is absolutely fascinating. So I'm curious, what is like one thing that you learned about yourself? I mean, you all are very self-actualized individuals. You do incredible things. You've got to know yourself very well to pursue the careers and interests that you each have. But is there something that you learned about yourself that you didn't know about yourself before, having gone through this experience of a Hera crew? Maybe start with you, Carrie. Yeah, um, gosh, I feel like I, I learned a lot. I will say one of the things I found the most surprising was that um, you know our schedule is super regulated inside Hera. So basically every task that we do is um, you know regulated down to the minute by mission control. And before the mission started, I thought that that might get a little bit annoying or that I might wish I had more control over my schedule. But for at least the six weeks that we were in there, I actually found it to be super relaxing to just not have to make that kind of um, decision and to just know exactly what I was supposed to be doing every minute of the day. And many of the activities that we did had some sort of metric associated with them. So not only did you know when to do them, but you knew if you were doing them well and uh, how to improve if you weren't doing them well. And um, kind of going along with your other question, um, another thing I learned was in my mission, I was the only non-pilot uh, crew member and we did a lot of flight simulations. And so it was just so great to get um, so many tips from Osama and Dan on how to do those better. And it was really uh, a fun challenge to progress at those uh, throughout the mission. Great, Osama, how about you? Uh, actually, to piggyback off of what Carrie said, um, one of the interesting things was um, that I noticed about how we were operating as a crew is we didn't necessarily openly talk about issues or challenges. We just sort of naturally uh, worked on them together collaboratively, which I thought was super cool. So each one of us brought our own strengths and weaknesses uh, to the mission. And depending on how the mission was proceeding or what activity we were working with, uh, each person's strength sort of shined and everybody sort of collected around that. And that was sort of rotating throughout uh, the crew uh, overall and that helped to complete our mission objectives. I thought that was super cool. Um, the interesting thing that I learned about myself in that is uh, uh, sort of I'm attracted to this idea of trying to figure out how much I don't know. And what I spent a lot of time, and I've talked about this with uh, the rest of our, our crewmates, uh, I spent a lot of time really trying to understand each crew member's strength as sort of something I would like to pick up on or something I would like to learn from 
because we have such diverse backgrounds and experiences, such diverse leadership styles, such diverse uh, expertise, and everybody sort of had this enormous value that you could learn from and incorporate in your in your everyday life. And uh, I, I thought that was sort of a very interesting product of being in isolation with three other uh, exceptionally bright, uh, awesome individuals who I think are far more intelligent than I am. Uh, but also, I think schedule wise, I think one th one fallacy that I've had most of my life, I think up until Hera, was that I could multitask. I, I have a very busy schedule, so I always thought I could multitask and I could be super productive. But turns out that was total nonsense. And it turns out I'm actually more productive by being given a task, a certain amount of time to do this task, and then move on and don't think about it. And I actually spent a lot of time incorporating that into my actual day to day uh, uh, after Hera, whether that's regulating my eating time, regulating what tasks I do at specific days of the uh, uh, specific times of the day, even my exercise times and, and things of such, and being really disciplined about that. And uh, I saw that actually shift a lot of how my productivity has functioned, especially during the pandemic and having to work remotely, sort of with uh, set your own set your own course kind of strategy. Fascinating. I just have to jump in to say, Osama, there's a whole body of research about multitasking. And how people who think they can multitask are much less effective and actually um, are not as productive. And so the way we're wired is it's much better to be focused on something and have a kind of a primary thing that you're working on. And uh, all of us believe that we're really great at multitasking and we're not. We actually We'll just do a little pitch for a different thought leader program. We did it. We did one on the importance of sleep in the sleep lab at NASA Johnson Space Center, which is absolutely fascinating. And we touched on this topic a little bit as well. So you need to get your sleep and you need to be focused to be to have maximum productivity. <laughs> so I'm curious to hear from uh, Ron and uh, Dan. What, what are things that you uh, took away? Yeah, for, so for me, um, well, number one, I need coffee. Um, <laughs> we we actually very very early on had uh you know had uh weighed down to the gram how much we we had for the the rest of the mission and then um and then had a reserve set aside and that was sort of a uh, consistent theme throughout the the mission but no i i have to say that I, I went into it really expecting that um we'd encounter some challenges with uh, with team dynamics or personality conflict or those those types of things and that that what i would learn would have something to do with that um but but I think we really I think our our crew complement each other well, and we really kind of fell into um, number one. Uh, you know everybody was just very accomplished and capable in their own right, and then on top of that uh, was very generous with their uh, their time and expertise, and um, so that anything that came up, you know there was somebody that would kind of pick up the slack if somebody else let it drop, and it was just it was a very natural thing. Um, I think the biggest thing I probably learned about myself is just that I can I can be satisfied with a with a lot less than than I typically you know sort of expect or seek out, and you know I went there with a giant bag of stuff and extra changes of clothes for you know weeks on end. I was envisioning a two week laundry cycle and very early on kind of fell into just wearing the same few things, washing them in the shower every couple of days, and you know I had my went from a you know, a bag of stuff this big to a bag of stuff this big and, um, you know, a few books and a Rubik's Cube and it was, you know, uh, really, really pretty content with that. So I think I'd make a good hermit and I wasn't expecting that. So Osama, I really like what you said about uh, multitasking and task focusing. When I first heard about Hera William, I went out and bought some books, some movies. I thought we're going to have, I'm, I'm going to be bored. We're going to have time to sit around. NASA really knows what it's doing as far as scheduling and keeping you busy and keeping you task oriented and on, on task focus. And I think for a long duration flight, that's going to be critical to the crew. Um, even Bob Crippen back in the 70s in the very short letter he wrote said, the secret of success is staying busy. And I firmly believe that that's a lesson I came out with. And uh, I, I think we're gonna have to address that on any long duration flight. And as was said, I mean, there's the element of what we call um, stress of choice, right, which is kind of very nice about having that schedule, because in your normal everyday life, you always kind of have to worry about, you know, 
am I doing the right thing right now? Is there something else that would be more productive for me to be doing rather than this thing? Whereas when you just have somebody laying that out for you and like, okay, from now to the next 30 minutes, it's time to do this thing and nothing else. And then after 30 minutes, you know, I'll go do something else. That's very kind of liberating, kind of low stress. Yeah, this is the joys of all of us working from home. This is the <laughs> life still happens around us, right? We can't stop that from going on. So please not to worry. Um, I guess I'm really curious about, would you guys do this again? If you had an opportunity to participate in another Hera experience, uh, would you would you sign up? And what would motivate you to want to do it a second time? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me personally, I, I would. I think I would do it again tomorrow. It was just as, as as was said. I mean, it's a great opportunity to contribute to the human spaceflight program, contribute to scientific advancement, but also it's a um, very unique kind of you know um, personal building and personal learning experience that I think was very valuable. And you get to meet some really great people who kind of become part of your life, and that's really kind of a very um, great opportunity to have. Yeah, I would also definitely do it again. Um, you know, it's been interesting to read about the earlier missions as, um, you know, I, we were in the fifth campaign. Um, so I would love to do it again in like five years and see how more advanced the analog has gotten. Um, you know, it's it went from being, I think, seven days in the first iteration. Now they're up to 45. Um, and so it would be great to see uh, how long it's going to be and what new systems are incorporated. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely do it again. I remember um, telling uh, one of the persons during debrief that uh, I'd absolutely do it again with this crew. Uh, I don't know if I'd want to do it with a different crew because the standard has been set so high. So, well, Sam, I'm going to go ahead and give uh, one stipulation too. I would do it again with my crew if it were in low Earth orbit. Oh, I like that caveat. That's a good one. You know, that's actually quite plausible. <laughs> that could happen. <laughs> Dan, um, I would do it again, hands down. Um, I think it would be it would be interesting, you know, going back to the uh, the same habitat and the same mission versus, you know, what it might be in, um, in you know, five years. Um, I agree if there's any if there's any way to involve zero gravity and orbiting the Earth as part of the uh, the isolation, then, you know, then doubly so. But uh, it was a great experience. I would I would, I would definitely do it again. Well, I regret to say we're coming to the close of our time, and I've had such an amazing experience talking with all of you. I could keep this conversation going on for much longer, and I really appreciate all that you have done to help advance space exploration and specifically human space exploration. I think your interests are really possible to think in a year we're going to have actually private citizens going to International Space Station you know, um, as part of commercial crew, they're gonna, there are so many things happening. And I think all of you have a leg up from your experiences in terms of that preparation to be successful on those uh, human missions as we prepare to send astronauts back to the moon and ultimately on to Mars. And so I wanna thank you on behalf of Space Center Houston for being part of this conversation. We hope to have you back again in the future to hear your further reflections and uh, thank our audience for joining us today for our Thought Leader series on HERA. Thank you so much. Have a great day. We can simulate what it is like to be in a spacecraft. So the isolation, the confinement, the controlled environment. The research investigations are aimed at answering some of the questions that we need to answer before we send people on those extremely long duration missions, such as to an asteroid or to Mars. It's probably about the size of, um, I'll say maybe a, a one bedroom apartment that's not terribly, terribly luxurious. Um, but on the other hand, it's, uh, it emulates what you might see in a spacecraft. 
A lot of the things that you have on the first floor are things like workstations. You know, some of the computer and some of the simulation devices are on the first floor. Uh, we have a lot of um, capabilities for performing different kinds of experiments. The second floor, it's kind of like your living room. There's a table that the crew members can sit at and eat their meals. All of our food right now is coming from the Johnson Space Center Food Lab, which means it's the same food that goes to the International Space Station. There's also uh, a capability for them to play videos or to watch movies. We have a couple of exercise devices, a bicycle in particular, and then we also have some free weights. We find that a lot of our crew members will also do some calisthenics, some stretching, um, maybe some yoga. So there's a little tiny little place for them to be able to do that. The final level, if you will, is really not a full story. It's really the sleep quarters. It's bigger than a pup tent. Each crew member has his or her own uh, sleep quarters. Um, it's actually very cozy, very comfortable. The hygiene module has a flushing toilet. Um, we have a stand-up shower with hot and cold running water, and we also have a sink with hot and cold running water. The final element of the module is a, a very small module that is an airlock. And we do isolate or subdivide the crew uh, such that two crew members will go into the airlock, and that is where they'll do their virtual reality EVAs from. I'm excited for the challenge. I love a good challenge. I'm a professor at Grand Valley State University. I, I teach biology. I feel like I'm actually playing, it's a small role, but it's, it's a real tangible, important role in getting people to Mars. The first thing I saw about this was on a Facebook posting, and a couple of former Hera crew people had posted that they, were, they had just come out. I didn't think I would be selected, and you know, I just kind of did it on a lark, and it worked out awesome. They are measuring us in more ways than I could have imagined. We've given a lot of biological samples of various types. They're measuring our heart rate, our brain waves. They're doing a tremendously large number of psychological tests on us. This mission, the crew members are going to an asteroid. So while they are on their way to the asteroid, they are going to practice. Uh, their flying skills once they get to the destination. They're also going to be conducting some virtual reality EVAs. So on the way there, they're also practicing those skills. We have the housekeeping tasks for them. We have maintenance types of tasks. A primary purpose for the mission controllers is really to ensure the safety and well-being of the crew members who are inside the HERA to make sure that everything is going well, but it's really also to, as much as possible, to keep all of the scientific investigations happening as they're scheduled on time to answer any kind of questions. We provide some input, you know, a newspaper, if you will, electronically uh, to the crew members in their, I'll call it their morning mail. Uh, not allowing the internet access really does allow us to keep the crew members really engaged in the mission and not to be, you know, concerned about things that are going on in the outside world. The one little luxury, if you will, that they have is approximately once a week, we schedule them for a private family conference. So a telephone call that is patched in on a private uh, phone line. We do plan to keep the HERA operating for at least another four or five years. The 45-day missions, we're always going to be looking for qualified crew members to be able to come and join us and participate in the research studies.